So our executive director has informed me that uh, we have a little logistics going on. So thank you so much, Robert. Um, it's not often that everybody gets this opportunity uh, to uh, get, get kind of the perspective, not just of the director of NGA, but also somebody who has uh, been part of the, the forward-looking estimates of kind of the global security environment. So I think that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, OK. so. Where's John Konarski? We have some logistics. So this is a little bit of a test. Uh, it's more of uh, checking in on your cards. Who has filled out their pink cards? The numbers better be gone. Al Di Leonardo has not signed out his card. Frank Prouch came with his own PowerPoint. That's very frank. Um, so please uh, continue to fill those out. Those will be what drive the out year dialogue. And we will be collecting them at the end. We won't be grading them, though. So just take a breath and fill them out. Um, the other two cards, right, were the green card for the Bowman Expeditions. I want to know where we should do uh, Bowman Expeditions and why. Um, and the blue card, rank order those trends. Hopefully you talk to people in the lunch line uh, at your table about the trends that you had and that they had. And I want the ranked order, right, which is separate from your 10. And then for the last card, this is pretty much the afternoon card. And just sit and listen. So this yellow card is really about trying to understand what the gaps are. The gaps in technology, the da gaps in data, capabilities, methodologies, uh, laws and policies. The things we need to invest in to get ahead of the curve, to understand uh, not only how the world will be changing around us, uh, but also to understand the things that we might be able to do to adapt to that world. So you can list those to your heart's content, but let's say 10. Um, there's going to be a lot of ideas you're actually going to hear from uh, the, the panelists in the next two sessions um, as they come up, but don't restrict it to that. Uh, they only have seven to ten minutes each to kind of chat you up and, and explain what they see happening in the world, in the world of uh, technology. Um, but we really would like to have uh, your perspectives on all of this. So um, I think with that, we're dangerously close to being able to invite up our uh, two speakers for the future geography of the Internet of Things, Dr. Mike Botts and Mr. Jared Novick. Um, Dr. Botts is, uh, I think I've called it out before, um, is a Gardell's uh, uh, award winner of the Open Geospatial Consortium, one of our sponsors uh, uh, for Geography 2050, uh, which is the highest award the OGC gives out. And uh, Mike I've known now for almost 15 years, I think come January, uh, when we joined the Open Geospatial Consortium together at the first, our first TCs in Atlanta. I remember that. Um, and he's the father of sensor model language and the sensor web enablement architecture, which is global, uh, entire global ocean buoy networks that measure sea surface temperature and satellites and in situ sensors, et cetera. Um, so he's going to share his view on the future geography of the Internet of Things, which may or may not be a term he likes. Um, and then uh, Mr. Jared Novick, um, who I won't really introduce other to say uh, that he's recently elected to the AGS Council. Um, and uh, he'll be showing some of us uh, something new for the first time uh, that I won't disclose because that'd be like a spoiler. So um, anyways, I think we can start if Mr. Konarski believes we can. Okay. One more minute. Who has a mic? Is there a mic? Do we have a mic? Where's Jeff Harris? He just walked down. Do you have your trends, Carl? You do? Barb? No, 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 no. Barb, do you have your trends written down, Barb? I want Barb to have a mic. Can we give a mic to Barb? Who's going to be one of our speakers later? Give me your favorite trend that we have not talked about. I don't, I don't have a trend that we have not talked What's about. What's your favorite one that we talked about? Um, I guess, actually, let me go back. I do have a trend that we have not talked about, and that's the technological advances in the true 
integration of data, true integration of data. I don't think we, I don't think from the conversations that we've had already today, we've hit that issue okay. real hard. Okay. Technological advances in the true integration of data. So we're gonna have to think that one through. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna assume our minute's up and I'll pass it over to Dr. Botts. Great, thanks, so Chris. So thank you very much. Yeah, I was glad to hear um, Mr. Cardillo also because NGA has been a big, a big help in, in bringing forth international open standards as well as open source software and such. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that he's wanting to not only continue that, but maybe even expand it and such. And I'm also glad that he sort of gave you a little idea of what a person who deals with sensors is doing in a geography group. Um, you know, what is, what is the relationship between geography and sensors? Well, it doesn't do us any good to know that it's 39 degrees if we don't know where it's 39 degrees. So we need that spatial context. And then when you also want to start uh, combining multiple sensors to try to get a higher level of information, then, then you need to understand the relationship both uh, spatially and temporally on that. So I was glad to hear the things he had to say. So what I want to do is, uh, I, the, I guess the talk is supposed to be sort of the geography of the Internet of Things, uh, but I don't look at the Internet of Things perhaps the way some people do. And in fact, I think the Internet of Things is trying to find its, its meaning right now. And uh, so I, I sort of eliminated the Internet of Things from my, my, my title there. Uh, but let's look at, at the history of stuff. Uh, there we go. So, you know, the ARPANET, which was the beginning of what is called the Internet, really started in about 1969. There were four places that were linked up at that point. Uh, so not, not a very huge worldwide internet at the, at the moment. But it was also, it was the beginning of how we connect computers to computers and such. Um, and then sort of moving ahead to about 1990s and stuff, GIS was already going on. It wasn't quite brought to the web at that point. But we started looking at scientific data visualization. And, and this is sort of how do we take sensor data and start to, to put that on maps and, and convey it geospatially and temporarily and fuse it all together. So data visualization was going on and really quite frankly in the 1990s, GIS and data visualization were sort of clashing because GIS was about flat earth, no time, and a lot of the visualization we wanted to do with science data was about time all the time and, and about three dimensions and a few other things. So it was about that time that I ended up uh, meeting with Chris Tucker in Atlanta and, and Mark Reichert uh, and joined the OGC. And we immediately started working on the sensor aspects of things. So we started developing something called sensor web enablement where you could go out and, and discover sensors and task sensors and get the observations from sensors and so on. So that's been in the works for, for a little while and, and we're to the point now where uh, there are many important implementations of, of SWE going on around the world for debris flow monitoring in Taiwan and alerting population and for, you probably can't see it, but all the buoys in the United States now are supported using SWE and so forth. Um, one of the things is that it's not quite as ubiquitous as, as we want it to be, so there are some activities going on uh, to try to make it easy to just become part of the sensor web. But I'm going to sort of... Uh, start to, I'm going to open a, a, a floodgate or, or a fire hose here and start throwing a lot of stuff at you. And some of you in the room will probably, when I say some of these, these things, will immediately go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Others will say, I have no idea what you're talking about and I really have no interest in knowing what you're talking about. So just, just let it pass if that happens. So when we talk about the Internet of Things, that sort of started to become a buzzword in the last, say, four years or so. It was, it, the word was, the term was coined well before that, but really in the last four years, you're starting to see companies jump in and say, oh, well, I'm Internet of Things. And it's almost sometimes like the companies are trying to define Internet of Things to be what they do best. And so I really think that Internet of Things uh, has some problems with the name. First of all, I don't know that it's Internet of Things that we want. Internet sort of implies this connectivity. What we want is to be able to find all these things out on the web and deal with them. And I also have a few issues on the word things, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. So I, I pose the question, is it a term looking for a meaning or is it the next great revolution? And I don't know yet, but my suspicion is it's probably going to be both. 
I think we're going to evolve and try to figure out what's going on and what it really means, and, and then it, it will be the next revolution, I think. So you probably can't see these low contrast slides, I'm sorry. Um, but in my, my world, the way I think about things is perhaps a little different than what a lot of people in the Internet of Things are thinking. For me, there are things that sense, we call them sensors. There are things that act, we call them actuators. And there are things that think. I guess we can call them processors or processes. The um, interesting thing is that all of these things are a type of process. They all have inputs and outputs and methodologies that give you some result that you're wanting to get. Now, if you can see this, uh, there are sensors, actuators, processes on the top. A sense, the input of a sensor is something out in the environment that wiggles or sim stimulates the sensor. And then the, the output of it is our digital numbers. Actuators are the opposite. You've got digital numbers coming in. They make something wiggle in the environment. And then you've got processes that, where you feed in digital numbers and get out digital numbers. Uh, why is it important to think about this? Ooh, you really can't see that. That's going to be bad because this shows up a lot. Just imagine this whole little network there of things. Can you see the faint blue line Focus very hard? Um, what we're really wanting to do is not only go get this sensor and be happy with it. What we really need to be getting to is this idea of bringing all these sensors together, actuators together, processes together, to meet some purpose. Things like the anticipatory analytics and predictive analytics and so on. So that's. That's one of the things that I, I think we really need to think about in this Internet of Things. But if you think about it, all of these things are really a collection of sensors, actuators, and processors. The regular digital camera just has a ton of sensors in it, a lot of processes, and a lot of actuators. There are things like all of our mobile systems. There are weather stations. There are uh, home maintenance, distributed networking. You know, these things can actually work over the network. And then even, uh, even people are, are essentially a collection of sensors and, and uh, thinking processes and, and actuators, things that make, make something happen. So uh, think in that line. And those, this is why we really modeled SensorML and SWE to model everything as a process. So sort of keep that in mind as we move forward into the Internet of Things. Uh, and in the end, we're not interested in the thing it's really what the thing can do for us. I, I haven't even explained Internet of Things if you've never heard of it. It's sort of the general idea is that we want everything to be connected to everything else so that, so that my uh, weather station can talk to my sprinkler system and make it turn on at the right time. And my sprinkler system, I don't know, can, can tell the, the dishwasher, don't turn on yet, I'm using water and I don't want you to decrease my pressure and such. So that's sort of the concept. But it's really not the things we're interested in, it's the things that they do for us. They inform us, they help us decide things, and then they act on our behalf. So let's get back on this other track of, of the future here. What I'd like to do is sort of quickly track the progress of three topics. The things themselves, how will they evolve through the, through the years? Uh, what is the connectivity of things? How is that going to change through the years? And then this thing called a human thing interface. How do we interact with these things out in the world? So we're going to follow those. Let's first look at uh, what the situation is today. So right now we have all these uh, we have all these sensors and stuff out there. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, they're big. A lot of times they have stovepipes, what we call stovepipes. So if you want to interact with a particular sensor there, you've got to know how to find that sensor. You've got to know how to connect to that sensor. You've got to understand the data that's coming back and how it's coming back and so on and so on. So unfortunately, most all of our sensors have these stovepipes and there's no such thing as, oh, well, let me get on this point. And the other thing about these is most of these are government owned. So, uh, so they're, they're not in the uh, public sector. As far as the use of open standards and open data out there right now, it's not very popular. It's not quite there yet. It's not where it needs to be. Um, in terms of processing, like we were talking about before, that's not really there. Now let's talk for a second about how we interact with, with these sensors and these things. So if, you know, if I'm going to use my phone here, uh, I've got to think of something in my brain of where this sensor is and how I make contact with it. So then my brain's going to more or less tell my hand uh, what to do. My hand's going to type things. The, the phone's going to go out to the World Wide Web and go out to the sensor. And then this data is hopefully going to come back. 
It's going to put it in some sort of form that I can actually see and understand. So then it goes, uh, wow, something happened there. Okay, it goes back into my eyes and then it goes back into my brain. So that's a whole complex path of how we interface right now with sensor systems. So let's, let's look at our trend in things. How are these things changing? We're going from big to small, sometimes very small. Uh, we're going from stationary to mobile, so we're getting more things that we can just carry around with us or sticking on our cars or flying up in planes. Uh, they're, coming, they're going from expensive to very low cost. You can now you know, get little GPS chips that you can stick on a device for, for pennies. Um, and then there's the move from just a few of these sensors to a whole lot. So those are sort of the trends. Open standards, uh, yes, they're starting to be looked at and they're becoming very helpful. Uh, sensors are also becoming individually owned. So unlike the government owning most of the sensors out there, people are starting to own sensors again on their phones and they're setting them up and so on. Another cool thing that you're gonna hear about in just a second is this idea that individuals are not only owning these things, they're making their own sensors and making their own stuff. So uh, Jared's gonna talk about the makers project where people are actually doing, doing it yourself type of stuff and making sensors. And uh, all of these sensors are becoming more and more location aware. Most time we've put out sensors and they're pretty dumb. Uh, nowadays we, we are knowing where these sensors are and that's extremely important. Because knowing where a sensor is provides the relevance to us. We know whether it's relevant or not. And then real-time processing, sometimes right on board the sensors. So that's sort of the trends and things. The trends and thing connectivity is we are starting to connect, have an increased connection through open standards and such. Um, and I just want, to, want you to keep in mind that it's not only the machine or the sensor to human inter communication we need, it's machine to machine, so we need uh, computers being able to talk to sensors and back and forth and so on. And then there's crowdsourcing. Again, we're walking out into the public and everybody's got their phones and everybody's got Fitbit things that are measuring stuff. All of a sudden we're out there where we can get all sorts of information from, from the crowd that we weren't able to get before. And then the other change that's going on is or you can just buy these boards for like $35. Some of them like Raspberry Pi and the Enforce boards plug up sensors to it and you're now on the web and uh, can do neat stuff. So all of that's, that's pretty cool. And then there's this very strong desire, you heard uh, Mr. Cardillo, this idea of being able to do anticipatory analytics, getting sensor data and, and uh, from, if you get an, an alert from one sensor, you may fire off and task another sensor and you get other, other results and then you can bring all this together, process it and, and come up with not only what is going on now, but what might be going on tomorrow. So that's really where we're wanting to go. Now the trends in human thing interfaces. I don't know how many of you are familiar with augmented reality, but it's, it's the idea that we have our eyes that see and we wanna be able to put things in front of that and add more data so that we can see the world and see information about the world on top of that. So there are things like uh, new interfaces. Hopefully most of the interfaces are better than the guy up on the left there, but we're getting Google glasses and, and, and gloves that can touch things. There are open standards for uh, uh, augmented reality. And then there's a lot of apps that are coming out. You can go download several apps that use augmented reality. If you're a golfer, maybe it helps you determine how far away the hole is. If uh, you're touring some area, it will point out where things are and such. And then we're also doing the same thing with augmented reality for scientific data. And this, this is a picture of an actual picture of a thunderstorm. And then the, the infused in that is the radar imagery of, of the stuff going on inside. So it gives you the ability to be able to see what's, what's going on in the cloud. You may not be able to read that, but essentially think about it. What are the implications of these trends uh, in terms of the planet's geography and the human geography? Uh, it starts to raise a lot of ideas of where we're going. You know, being able to tap into, we've got sensors now that are gonna be everywhere. We're gonna have connectivity to those sensors. We're carrying them around in the crowd. Uh, so how does this change the way that we start to do things uh, as humans? We'll try to get a little more into that and I'm not gonna answer all these questions because I think that's your job as human geographers and, and such. Um, 
So let's look at the future of things. And I've changed the words here instead of pictures. But things are going to be micro. Sensors will be very small. In fact, so small we'll be able to probably ingest some of these. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more with DNA growing, these, these sensors and so on. The idea of sensor dust, which has sort of been floating around, where a plane can fly over and just sort of snowflake all of these sensors on the ground for whatever purpose. Uh, I think that will be around. You've, we've talked about it, embedded sensors. I think embedded sensors and actuators and processors are going to be in everything. They're going to be part of our clothing. They're going to be obviously parts of our cars and everything else. Um, I think our bodies will be self-monitoring and self-healing, perhaps with these micro sensors, micro actu actuators. Buildings will also be self-monitoring and self-healing. From the very construction, they'll actually have the sensors on them that will determine whether or not something's going wrong and how to, how to fix it. And then I think robots and cyborgs will exist. It's just sort of that thing that I think you lose a limb, perhaps you know, adding, adding robotics to the limb is, is a benefit and such. So I think we'll start to see this merging of people and machines. Now, some of you may cringe at that, and sometimes I do, but it's one of those things in society we have to face and decide whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. So what about the future connectivity of things? The web will, I can promise you the web will be nothing like it is today. And that's also one of the reasons I have a problem with the internet of, of things as, as a term. Uh, but the web will be always on, it will be always connected, and it will be everywhere. So wherever you go, you are part of the web. Everything will be web accessible, everything will be location aware. And then things like this, this idea of the processing chain of sensing, acting, um, and, and processing and stuff will just be the way we do business. We won't even think about it anymore. And of course, in the end, we will be connected and we will be things on the web. You heard Mr. Cardello talk about us being, being sensors, and we, we very much are. So here's where things get a little freaky. We start looking at the future of human thing interfaces. Um, again, I think augmented reality right now primarily relies on vision. I think we'll start to use our other senses a little bit more. We'll start to, if there's a danger behind us detected by something, we'll probably get some auditory thing that will, will make us turn around uh, and so on. So I think we'll be able to use more, more than our current just vision. And here's where things, I know you're not going to believe me on this, but I think the, the human interface to the web of things will ultimately involve direct connection to the brain. And if you think I'm just sort of going wild there, uh, in 1990s, they were doing experiments with just reading brain waves on the outside and being able to steer sailboats just by, by learning how to think about steering sailboats. And, and lo and behold, the boat went where they wanted it to go. There was also in 1990 a DARPA request for proposals where, if you read between the lines, it was basically talking about a direct connect to the visual nerve so that you could then try to overlay computer data computer-generated data into your, directly into your visual site. But let's suppose that we actually get to the point to where, you know, right now I'm sitting at home watching a, a show with my wife and I think about that actress, I say, what else was she in? And I pull up my iPad and I type in Google and I look and say, oh yeah, that's what it is. But think about the time when we might actually be able to think and think outside of what our brain already has. It, it's a wild thought, and it's kind of scary. It'll change education completely because no longer are we spending 12 to 18 years cramming facts in our brain, but we'll be probably better learning how to use all that information and explore things. Well, the same thing in the sensor world. All of a sudden now, we're not doing that, that eye to hand thing. We're just going brain to, to sensor. And so we can start to tap into all these sensors that are out there in the distributed world and so forth. Okay, so wild stuff. Think about that for a couple of days because it, it, it kind of gets fun and to think about uh, being able to just directly connect. So what are the consequences to all of this, of all of this to human geography? Well, I think we'll become more location agnostic. What does that mean? It means that um, the things that we experience and the things that we make happen in the world will not just be limited to something around close, close around us. We'll be able to explore other environments, other places. We'll be able to be there in not physical sense, but be there. 
and we'll be able to influence things going on there. Uh, we, we definitely are going to be much more heavily monitored by video cameras. We're seeing that already in London, video cams on every street, looking every di different direction. We're starting to get it now. Uh, if it's all handled by the government, if the government's the one that controls all those, then we start having these worries about Big Brother. But what happens if all of these cameras and all of these sensors are actually in the public domain and any one of us can tap into them and see what's going on? If I'm going to walk down that street late at night, I should be able to to see what the street looks like before I go heading that way. Uh, this also makes me think about my wife who grew up in a small town called Russellville, Alabama. And if any of you from small towns, you know that everybody is not only recognizable, but everybody recognizes everybody. They know who you are, they talk about you, they know what you're up to. I just saw Billy Bob down at the Piggly Wiggly and he was with somebody I, I uh, didn't know. And um, all of a sudden you start getting into things about maybe uh, we become like small town, even, you know, even in the big city, it becomes more small town where people are watching out for each other as well as sort of watching each other and uh, trying to, you know, maybe, what's the word, trying to make you accountable to society. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe we, we do think we'll lose privacy and secrecy I don't have, I have no idea what it will do to the haves or have nots. Will it be an equalizer or will it be divisive? Uh, physical travel will just be more selective or will we just not do it at all because we don't really need to because we can go experience this town without actually paying for the flight and going through all that trouble. And then there's things like uh, how can we be useful in the world if we're now as citizen monitors and citizen police and citizen observers being able to say, uh, I, you know, I want to do something about poaching in Africa. Right now, all we can do is say, wow, I hate that. I wish we didn't, you know, it wasn't going on. And I can watch the National Geographic and say, yeah, that's terrible stuff. But what can I do about it other than buying a ticket and going over there and trying to do something, which I'm sure would accomplish nothing. But think in that day when we can now tap into sensors that are out there in the high risk areas where poaching's going on and we can receive alerts if something happens and we can go check the monitors and, and find somebody violating things, determine where they are, and, and then report them and do something. All of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of useful things like that. There's, I'm sure there's a zillion of them all of you can think about. And so all of a sudden we become uh, poacher catchers right from our recliners and so on. I'm about done. So I suggest also you go to the movies because Science fiction writers have always been the best source of looking to the future and warning us about things. And there were a couple of movies that I really liked, Eagle Eye, which my wife slept through but I really enjoyed, uh, is about sort of this idea of what if you have the power to deal with all those sensors and make things happen with actuators and do all that kind of stuff, but you abuse that power. Uh, the Surrogates is an interesting one about people deciding it's better just to live their life through these these droids out there and they go and their whole life is lived out on the streets and they never leave their house because they don't need to. Uh, but of course, you know, that's going to go wrong. So go see that movie. That's cool. And then there's another one that if you're easily offended, I'd suggest don't go see, don't look at this one. It's just, it's just a video clip, but it's in a little Italian clip that shows the importance of understanding your source of information and, and the accuracy of it. So, so go to the movies and that's it. I appreciate it and uh, hope you're all going to help us figure out where to go from here and what we should and shouldn't do and so on. Thanks. So I said, just switch seats. Uh, just go ahead. Can you click me? I don't think I do. Well, hello, I'm Jared. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the AGS uh, Society and Chris for having me talk today. I really appreciate it. It's certainly a uh, aesthetically pleasing venue and a strategically important one, too, as we get all different leaders from different sectors talking about the strategic importance of geography in 2050. I am a geomaker. That might be a new word to you. Uh, what is a geomaker? It should be the next question. And I, in fact, I have a little video I'd like to show you on exactly what our geomaker revolution is all about. This is an exciting time in three seemingly different areas. Something special is happening with maps, how individuals make stuff, and how we share information. 
Both the geospatial revolution and the maker's revolution are afoot, and the open source revolution is ensuring that their fruits will be shared globally. Through creating maps, making stuff, and sharing information, we are igniting the geomaker revolution. Believe it or not, we are all explorers. We have a natural curiosity about our surroundings. We wonder what's looming over that hill. We want to see where we are in relation to other people in unfamiliar areas. We also want to know faster routes to work. Recorded history makes this crystal clear. The Neanderthals explored, the Greeks explored, Marco Polo, Zhang He, Columbus, Magellan, Lewis and Clark, Sacagawea, Jacques Cousteau, Sir Edmund Hillary, and Neil Armstrong all explored. You also explored on your last family vacation. Maps are tangible illustrations about humans' adventures and explorations. Maps are tools that have helped us since the times of the earliest humans. And companies like Google continue to explore today. Maps and the act of mapping help satisfy our geographic curiosity. We are also makers. As a species, humans build things to solve problems, to make the tools we need to make capabilities which help us explore. Our present day technologies are changing the way we make. We no longer need big companies to prototype our ideas. We don't need large contracts to fabricate our dreams. We are on the brink of a game-changing do-it-yourself or DIY industry. There are thousands of people emerging today from the maker movement who are industrializing the DIY spirit. And thanks to 3D printers, laser etchers and cutters, smartphones, commodity GPS chips, and other amazing new technology, people are making at an exciting rate. We are beginning to own our own means of production. Today's innovative cavemen and explorers are coming out of their garages and secret underground laboratories. Today's makers are building in an open community with access to maker tools and sharing their ideas. The combination of the web, powered by DIY fuel, democratizes tools of invention and production. Geomakers make physical things which help us explore, navigate, and understand the world around us. What you need can be learned and shared online. We share geo recipes so that people across the world can download other geomakers instructions and do with them what they will. So we invite you to geomake with us. Join your friends in this geomaking ecosystem and cross pollinate your ideas. If you're not good at building things, that's okay. You can dream of ideas others should work on as a geo dreamer. If you're not good at ideas, but you like to build, then you can make dreams a reality. And if you want to start your own adventure, become a geo booster by building your friends' ideas, collecting data in your backyard, and posting your successes so others can learn from your experience. All of us are geo makers. So strap a GPS enabled camera onto your bike. Launch a mapping balloon with your friends. Build a GeoMaker widget for your backpack when you climb that mountain. Create a 3D model of your favorite public library. Put your discoveries on a map. Come join your GeoMaker family and start dreaming, learning, building, and sharing. Become a GeoMaker. This is an exciting time. Well, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we've been up to. Uh, in fact, we've got a little website if you want to see that video at home, and we've actually got a poster in the back if you want to have a copy. So what are makers? Um, is this a wacky idea? Um, where is it right now? The world is already in the throes of a maker revolution. The maker train has already left the station, and the maker reach is farther than you may think. And makers span more than just geography. If you're in a fashion and enjoy making clothes, some people call you a clothing maker. If you enjoy to garden and grow vegetables, then you'd be called a garden maker. And as we've learned, if you're into geography and you'd like to navigate, explore, and describe the world around you, then you can be called a geomaker. The point being is that makers are industrializing the DIY spirit. The revolution, thanks to the acceleration of enabling technologies, highlights the narrowing gap from high-cost manufacturing to the commoditization of tools and goods. Today's barrier to entry in the manufacturing arena is at an all-time low. 
They say the last several decades of the internet has been about connecting people with ideas via bits, those tiny zeros and ones which form the internet's connective tissue and appear on your computer screen and mobile devices. Bits are those weightless elemental units of the World Wide Web. They are now saying that the next several decades will be about turning those bits into atoms we can touch, build, and use. We live in a physical world. We use physical tools, and we make physical things. In fact, the movement from atoms to bits has already started. And to give you a sense of scale, a sense of perspective, the economic numbers support this. US Today says makers pump 29 billion in the economy each year. Wired says 3D printing value, the overall market for 3D printing. Products and services hit 2.2 billion in 2012, a compounded annual growth of rate of 29% compared to the 1.7 billion the industry recorded in 2011. 3D printing in North America and Asia Pacific accounted for more than 68% of the 3D printing materials in 2012. And to give you an idea of the breadth of the movement, approximately 135 million US adults are makers. Not all of them are geomakers, but these are the people who employ their creative skills and craft activities such as making clothing, jewelry, baked goods, works of craft and art. You can see this on Etsy today. That's 57% of the American population, 18 and up. So people are making. I sincerely believe a large part of the future of geography will be about turning bits into atoms and those atoms becoming location aware. Bits and atoms at what I call a grid or a lateral, lat, latitude or longitude is geo-revolutionary. I believe in something I'm calling open source for grids, bits, and atoms. The breadth of this movement will span age groups, skill sets, capabilities, and out of necessity, encourage global geographic and economic integration. Capabilities would be shared openly because they will be commoditized. The net effect of this change, I anticipate, and others as well, will change the landscape of geography as we know it. So I encourage you to start thinking about the magical convergence of open source software, open source hardware, and their intersection with location-aware technologies. If the purpose of Geo, uh, Geo 2050 is to begin a multi-year strategic dialogue on vital trends that will reshape our nation and planet, then I ask, how will open grids, atoms and bits, change location-based policy? How does the acuity and timeliness of data collection improve when it's crowdsourced? How does the open source commoditization of spatially aware, technically mature bits and atoms change national security? How does the face of commerce change when emerging markets become spatially empowered, manufactured by their own means and low-cost tech? And how can movements like the GeoMaker movement give STEM a place on the map? The answers are complex. However, the questions form a foundation for a larger discussion. Open grids, atoms, and bits must be considered when developing a strategic vector for the discipline of geography. Geomakers, as an educational not-for-profit, are exploring these open grids, atoms, and bits. We are attempting to characterize this new landscape. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was an online platform where someone in the US would come up with a dream of how to make something in their own garage, and then someone in China were to put that together, and then someone in India were to able to collect streetcar view uh, imagery and serve that openly. That commoditization, that democratization of tools and services uh, will have a, undoubtedly a profound impact in geography. So we believe makers are fundamental in transforming ideas into physical realities. And we believe those solutions are open commodities that should span the globe. Thank you. So uh, I want to ask a couple questions that you guys have to answer together. And then I, maybe we'll open it up, but somebody's got to really raise their hand with enthusiasm to kind of break into it. So 
I think there's some people in the audience that say I, I, makers never heard of it. Right. I don't really get it. So just with a little bit of context. Uh, so the the editor of Wired magazine. Everyone in this room's heard of Wired magazine. Uh, Chris Anderson authored a book called Makers: The New Industrial Revolution. Maybe a year Second ago. Industrial. Second industrial. Second industrial. Two two years ago maybe. And then left Wired magazine and created DIY Drones, a company. If you go on the web, you can pull down recipes to make your own drone. And that's a little bit of a GeoMaker project. I mean, it's just the platform, but once you start putting cameras on it and you start using it for mapping missions, it's you know. So it's actually happening kind of at the highest levels of Silicon Valley industry, et cetera. So a little bit of context. It's coming like a freight train, and Jared just put a name on it. Um, but I want to ask Jared kind of the question from Mike Botts, right? So we're talking about sensors, actuators, and processes that are getting smaller, uh, 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 you know, faster, cheaper, and more easy to distribute um, in a way that people can publish them as web accessible services, right? Which means people who currently have no access to the means of production and no ability to do remote sensing or sophisticated geolocation will be able to download something that designed by a Brit and then, you know, fabbed by a, a Polish guy and then, you know, implemented in Uganda. We'll be able to deploy it and publish it to a loon balloon as it's going by with 3G connectivity over Africa for virtually free. Right. Um, so in terms of the internet of things, uh, I mean, to you, right, Jared's just laid out this maker thing. How do you think about your, whatever you called it, because you don't like the internet of things, with the, when the maker kind of fuel is thrown on the fire? Uh, well, I think that's definitely the way it's going to go and needs to go. Um, I think it's still hard right now to, to connect sensors <coughs> to the web. And I think that's really the focus of the internet of things, trying to do that as well as the sensor web enablement stuff going on at OGC. Uh, I think some of the things I see in Internet of Things, I think, are fall a little bit short because they, they're basically just about pushing numbers between devices. <clears throat> and I think we need to keep in mind that the sensors need to be able to report their accuracy and things like that. Of course, that shouldn't be something that Joe Blow, getting his sensor printed, has to worry about. It should just be a part of the system and so on. So I, I think it's kind of proliferated just anybody being able to order sensors and if they've got their own printer printed out or to ask you know, for, I want 10,000 of these sent to my front door. So Jared, uh, the maker's revolution, it, you have, I've seen you put good words to it. Um, it it's, it's kind of learning by doing or I mean it's education by making. Um, there's all sorts of great quotes out there over the history of, of civilization about, you know, learning in different ways. Um, but, but learning about geography through making is kind of a totally different way of going about it. So what are some thoughts you have on that? Well, as my uh, video tried to highlight, uh, I, I fundamentally believe that all humans have a natural curiosity about their surroundings. Uh, sometimes you want to walk over the hill. Uh, maybe some people want to fly an airplane over it, launch a balloon, fly a kite. There are certain things that you want to know about your uh, spatial context. Um, I believe that this is a natural uh, fuel that all kids have. And if they can learn by discovery, because the barriers of entry are so low with cheap commodity GPS chips, if they can print them in their own garage and do something mean meaningful, I believe there's a learning progression that exists there that they actually fall into by accident. And they actually may act have uh, and learn uh, important skill sets that translate into the hardcore sciences like STEM. Yeah, and Deborah brought up earlier today that they need to maybe start using more sensors to, to do urban geography and such. And she talked about satellites, but I think there's a whole bunch of sensors out there that it will exist and, and exist today in the city that can provide a lot of information. Um, you know, just simple, where, where is everybody and where are they moving? We can get that from cell phones today. But there's also radiation sensors, um, I mean, uh, data quality, not data quality, air quality sensors, and all sorts of other sensors that could go in and uh, be distributed by, by citizens who get these things made or make them themselves that can sort of add to our whole knowledge of this urban environment. Uh, in real time. So. 
So, bef oh, we do have a question from the back. Oh, we have two questions, but we'd have to get a mic. So, it's always in the back. we have three questions. <laughs> Raise your hand we'll, if you have a question. We'll do Karen first. We have oh, one in the back corner. <laughs> so, in, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to phrase this right, but I get this feeling as you talk that I don't know exactly as this technology happens, and I know it will. What, how do we define ourselves as human? in that we're talking about geography, but we're not going to walk in a park anymore. We're talking about human geography, but we're going to sit on our couch and be able to do everything. How do we challenge ourselves to do the uh, other side of that as we grow, which is keep ourselves human and keep kids wanting to keep the parks that we're trying to protect, right? How do we get that side as a society? Ooh. That's really a question I think you guys need to be answering. I mean, we're the techno nerds who just create the problems, and I think it's up to you to, to figure out those, those solutions. It is. Well, I, I think it's actually Bob Chen's point of, you know, what are the 10 things we can't anticipate that are going to completely change things? Um, uh, you know, it's always a shot in the dark. But, I mean, to your point, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the question I'll pose but not answer because we don't have time is it's pretty profound for the future of human geography when, you know, humans, humans and human capability are nece not necessarily kind of uh, 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 contextually, technologically enhanced forevermore, right? At least until the... The EMP pulse kills all of our technology and we're back to caveman days. Um, but I mean, you know, we'll be able to observe the other side of the world from our couch and what, what kind of beast does that unleash? I'd like to add just something real quick, yep. uh, two, two points on that. Uh, so I'm not always advocating for people to sit at home and explore the world. I want people to get their hands dirty, go out and collect. Uh, I think those two things can mutually exist. And uh, to use some kind of movie quotes as well for my second point, in the movie Goodwill Hunting, you remember when Robin Williams is sitting next to Matt Damon and he's saying, you could probably tell me so much about the Sistine Chapel. You can tell me more facts than because you're a genius, but you don't know what it's like to visit there in person. You know what it's like to have someone in, in, in stuck up for your buddy in Vietnam. Those are intangibles that aren't going to be replaced by technology, and that's just one man's opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, question right there. So I'm grateful that you were here to talk to us about this today, but it seems to me that as a parent, we've got this paradigm wrong. Like my son, when he was younger, was so creative. He believed his Legos could fly. I mean, really. And it seems to me that we should be partnering with you know, schools and educators earlier on in our kids' education to really make this you know, powerful and to make them believe that what they think and they build will actually work. I think Jared loves everything you just said. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it's funny to me, but you know, I gave my uh, iPhone to my 11-year-old daughter with the uh, Google Maps, and she navigated while I drove, and she thought it was the coolest thing to see street names on a phone and telling me when to turn, and then miles before I turned. It's, it, the things start to click spatially and actually motivates them in school again. So I think it's a very, I'm very passionate about this movement. I will say GeoMakers is intentionally kind of a K through 12 STEM yeah. thing, but not excluding lifelong learning. Because some of the cool stuff is, as the father of a 12 year old and 10 year old daughter, yeah, right. it's something I can go do that gets them science education, but it's fun. They're not doing science for science or geography for geography. They're doing fun for fun, and they just learned a whole bunch yeah. of geography. And I encourage you to explore DIY spacecraft or something. There are people who are making their own satellites. There's actually a whole other technical. Uh, challenge and layer that aren't necessarily accessible to kids because you have hardcore uh, talents and skills to throw at those harder problems. So we have a few more. One there, I want to get to Adrian, and then one there, and then we'll close it up. Okay, John? With this idea of DIY and geomaking, how do we validate accuracy? Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful question. Uh, and uh, there's actually a second presentation maybe I can show next year with Chris. Uh, it could be a chaotic world, right? You have a bunch of the masses are going to start making things and they're going to start taking pictures and putting things on maps. Uh, so how do you put order to that chaos? Uh, it's a great question. So I think things like this can dovetail nicely to the existing credentialing mechanisms going on within the community. If we partner with USGIF and had discussions, maybe there's a gamification or badging technique where people can accrue badges like a Boy Scout badge or a Girl Scout badge as they learn through their progression. And after they accrue certain skill sets, 
you can actually go to those people because they have more credibility or experience in a certain area. So that is one approach. It's a complex question, but it can be a chaotic world, and we're thinking about ways of making that more orderly. And there, there might actually be somebody in the back of the room that's already doing that for us. Maybe. There are two things that frighten me greatly, and you <laughs> both touched on them. One is walking down the street and encountering one of the phone zombies. Their ears are plugged up, their eyes are on their little toy, their hands have, one hand has got the toy, and the other hand has got a drink or a cigarette. They don't see you, they bump into you. They're living in a two-dimensional world. They're gathering all their information in two dimensions from a little screen, they go home, they may be on their computer, another two-dimensional screen, then they may watch television, another two-dimensional screen. They're not living in the three-dimensional world. They're retreating into the two dimensions. The other one is increasing lack of privacy in the world that we live in. We're being watched all the time. It's 1984 on the way. It's Big Brother watching you. There's cameras all over the place. There's one in the elevator in the building where I live. Um, they have their good points, of course. I think we've just caught the guy that pushed the, peep, pushed the, uh, the Chinese fellow on the subway this week um, through surveillance cameras. But these are really, really dangerous things. And people who are technologically oriented often do not think of the consequences. They just love all this new, all this new toys, and they don't think of the political and social consequences of what is going on today. So I hope that's one of the investments you put on what color card uh, about the things we need to invest in. Location privacy, I think, is a massive issue. You're absolutely right. And in the context of what Mike and Jared have said today, um, uh, I think it's particularly profound. So we have the last. Adrian, you still have a question in the back corner? Uh, hi. I think uh, my question was sort of asked in a very general way by the First Lady, but I guess I'll try to um, maybe narrow the scope a little bit more. You know, what's interesting to me is I look at the maker movement, 3D, alternative manufacturing, all of these things that arise from technological changes. It's interesting because this gap between consumers and producers that Toefler's pointed out, and I forget which book it was, but basically the Industrial Revolution drove a wedge between consumers and producers. All of this is now starting to merge, and, and the big change to me in the 21st century is the, is the rise of choice. And I would actually add a few other types of people to the mix of consumers, producers. There are facilitators, there are hoarders, and there are destroyers. So looking at all of that then, and, and maybe this isn't the right question because you kind of said you're, you view it from purely from a technological, and maybe this is just a question for a future GEO 2051, yeah. <laughs> um, is you know, what does this mean for the consequences of us as we work? Um, right now, most of us work to live. What happens when we don't necessarily need to work to live? Some, uh, quite a few people don't work at all. Um, they're sort of barely subsisting. But what happens when this whole late 19th century, 20th century paradigm of working to live is no longer the required paradigm? What does that mean for human society, uh, for how we evolve? And it goes to the question the other lady was asking. Oh, by the way, my 12-year-old cousin dragged me into a Lego store this last weekend, so uh, it was kind of interesting to see Legos do actually now fly and drive and do all kinds of other stuff. And he okay. actually built something that was not Lego related, but he learned how to make it operate and go faster than anybody else because of the Lego experience, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> and so write that trend on your pink card. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, I guess, first of all, you know, technology always moves forward whether we want it to or not, right? And a lot of times, we either can't anticipate the problems that it's going to bring, or we wait until they occur before we then find the solution. I mean, even if you look at something as simple as all of a sudden the internet was there and we could get all this information, but man, it was too much information. <clears throat> How can I get what I want? And then Google came out with, you know, giving us relevance. But these moral issues are going to have to be resolved and such. As far as the, uh, <clears throat> the person not needing to work, I have a lot of friends who, they have their day job, but their real passion is something they do at nighttime and, uh, and, or the weekends or whatever. And I think maybe we can get to the point to where people will just be able to follow their passions, whether it's this guy catching poachers in Africa or whatever it may be. I think in many ways it will free us up to be able to choose the things we want to do. If we want to make things, then we become an expert on making things. And, uh, so it's, it's going to be a different world. So final comment, Jared, and then we'll yeah, close. Yeah. Uh, just so I'll tackle that last question a little bit as well. 
those may have been the same concerns with the first industrial revolution. You know, people working on the line saying, these computers and machines are going to replace my job. What am I going to do? But it was a tremendously successful good thing for the world. Uh, I look at the maker movement with a very low, an ankle-high barrier to entry so that people can now quickly facilitate an idea and put them into practice and uh, become entrepreneurs that create services and goods. I find that to be a good, healthy thing, a competitive nature for the economy, I believe, is a good thing. Uh, and we will find the next gaps that need to be fulfilled in new industries that are yet to be defined. Great. Well, thank you very much to our speakers. Please give them a round of applause. It's now my privilege to uh, include as a part of the symposium today a very short ceremony honorary, uh, honoring the most recent winner of a prestigious AGS medal. So I'll hand it over to Jerry Dobson, president of AGS, for the ceremony. Thank you. Professor Malecki. Distinguished participants, AGS counselors and fellows, faculty and friends of Columbia University, honored guests. One of the greatest pleasures of my job is honoring those who practice and advance geography in outstanding ways. Today we present the Van Cleef Memorial Medal to Professor Ed Malecki of The Ohio State University. AGS has conferred medals since 1896. We do it to reward those who serve the discipline, nation, and world exceptionally well, but also to encourage strategic directions in basic and applied research and in the practice of geography. The Van Cleef Memorial Medal was established in 1970 through a gift from Dr. Eugene Van Cleef, Professor Emeritus of Geography at The Ohio State University, who contributed the fund in memory of his wife, Frida. It is fitting that we honor one of his own academic descendants today. In 1923, Dr. Van Cleef gave the first course in urban geography at an American university, and in 1937 published the first book on urban themes by an American geographer. The award is conferred on scholars who have done outstanding original work in the field of urban geography, preferably, though not necessarily, in applied rather than theoretical aspects. The medal was designed by Joseph DiLorenzo. I now call, call on Dr. Douglas Sherman, chair of the AGS Honors Committee, to read the citation. Doug. Good afternoon. It's my distinct honor as chairman of the AGS Honors and Awards Committee to read the citation for the Van Cleef Memorial Medal. As you just heard, the Van Cleef Memorial Medal is, des is designated to be conferred on scholars who have done outstanding original work in the field of urban geography. This designation matches perfectly the career-long contributions of Professor Edward J. Malecki of the Department of Geography at The Ohio State University where he's worked since 2001 after a lengthy tenure at the University of Florida. He has served as the director of the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, is affiliated with the John Glenn School of Public Affairs, the Department of City and Regional Planning, and the School of Public Policy and Management, all at Ohio State. To warrant these appointments, he has produced consistently original research aimed at increasing our understanding of how cities evolve, for example, as economic hubs and as places, and how digital technologies are influencing those evolutions. Dr. Malecki is a native of the Midwest, born in Columbus, Ohio in 1949. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree at Ohio State in International Studies. And as part of that curriculum, he took geography courses from some of the best geographers of that era, including Larry Brown, Reg Gollage, and Ned Tafe. That contact helped uh, direct him to graduate work in geography, also at Ohio State, where he earned his master's and doctoral degrees. Much of his early work uh, focused on the diffusion uh, of, of innovation. Uh, for example, this sounds archaic now, the spread of cable television through the Midwest in the 1970s. 
1975, he took up a position as an assistant professor of geography at the University of Oklahoma, where he was also a research fellow in science and public policy. He was promoted to associate professor in 1981 and moved to the University of Florida in 1983, where he was promoted to professor in 87 and served as chair of that department from 1988 to 1995. It was travel abroad during the 1980s and 90s, and his observations of the different urban structures and lifestyles in Europe and Asia that led to his, and I quote his, uh, um, his words, interest in how leading world cities deal with the challenge of combining new technologies with historical urban form and architecture. Those are his words, and they describe an incredibly successful scholarly mission exemplified by a number of professional publications that approaches 300. He's the author or co-author of five books, including Technology and Economic Development, colon, The Dynamics of Local, Regional, and National Competitiveness, and The Digital Economy, colon, Business Organization, Production Processes, and Regional Developments. Both books received positive reviews in leading journals in our field for the depth and breadth of their coverage and the timeliness of the topics that they treat. Dr. Malecki has held visiting positions at Verschaff Universität Wien and at the University of Newcastle upon Time. He's been recognized as the Dr. Martha L. Corey Faculty Fellow in Geography at The Ohio State University, was elected a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and has received distinguished scholarship honors from the Association of American Geographers. Beyond these specifics stand his record, stands his record of training 20 PhD students, most of whom have earned academic appointments to continue his rich intellectual heritage and improve our understanding of how modern cities function and evolve. And I now ask that Dr. Malecki, Mr. John Gould, the chairman of the American Geographical Society, and Dr. Dobson join me for the presentation. Therefore, for these reasons and more, on behalf of its grateful members, worldwide scholars, and all who recognize the importance of excellence in geographical research and exploration, the American Geographical Society honors Dr. Edward Malecki by presenting him with the Van Cleef Memorial Medal for outstanding original work in the field of urban geography on this 19th day of November uh, in the year 2014 in New York City. Congratulations, Ed. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, American Geographical Society, the council, for the confidence they have in me. Um, I am truly honored. Uh, the, my predecessors in receiving this medal are few and far between, but they're people from whom I've learned throughout my career. Um, and I've learned from many of you who are here in this room and uh, hope to be able to continue to do so. I'm particularly uh, pleased to be able to say that my son Michael is uh, present with us today. Um, he and his mom and I went to some of the world's great cities when he was a child, including Tokyo and Vienna, uh, several months in Vienna when I had a Fulbright. Um, so he knows as well as anyone that I am as I would put it, a city kid. I love cities. <laughs> um, people ask if I want to go to the beach or the mountains for vacation, I'd say, a city, please. <laughs> um, but let me pose a challenge to you, uh, given what I've heard so far today. Um, Deborah Balk and Neil Golightly did kind of tease us with the fact that cities are our geographical future. More people will live in cities than not. Cities are not all alike, right? They attract different ethnic groups, different people. They become different archetypes. Yet, what we don't know about cities is vast. Think about our geospatial technologies. They tell us a lot about agriculture, about land use, about the locations of energy production, but not so much about the other economic activities that take place and mostly in cities. And even more, and this was just hinted at in the question period just before this, the informal activities that we don't know about, what people do in their evenings when they're off of their, their uh, day job, 
What about the people who are working two or three jobs, some of whom are unrecorded and informal? Now, I'm not just saying the economy is, well, the economy is this big iceberg that we only see the tip of. And I think that that is one of our biggest challenges. It's the thing that is most unknown and yet most important as we go towards 2050. Thank you again very much. Thank you, and congratulations again, Ed. Now, you may notice that there's still another medal sitting here on the table. We have a surprise for you. We will now award the Cullum Geographical Medal to a very special colleague. Even the recipient has no idea what's coming. So for a moment, all of you can imagine that you may be the one. <laughs> Drum roll, please. The Cullum Geographical Medal is hereby awarded to Dr. Lee Schwartz, Geographer of the United States. <laughs> It is especially fitting that we should honor the geographer of the U.S. Department of State. Earlier, I mentioned that AGS led the inquiry in World War I. What, it, what I did not say is that the function we performed was then institutionalized as the office of the geographer at the State Department. The role of our director, Isaiah Bowman, became that of the geographer, and the maps we made at Versailles became the foundation of the State Department's map library. As we honor Lee, it's almost as if we were honoring one of our own. The Cullum Geographical Medal was established in 1896 and was the first medal awarded by the Society. It was funded through a bequest from Major General George W. Cullum, command, Commandant of the United States Military Academy, who was also an AGS counselor and vice president from 1874 until his death in 1892. Even today, every cadet who graduates from West Point gets his Cullum number, which follows him or her through an entire career. According to the terms of General Cullum's will, the medal is awarded, quote, to those who distinguish themselves by geographical discoveries or in the advancement of geographical science. The medal was designed by Lydia K. Emmett. I now again call for Douglas Sherman, chairman of the the AGS Honors Committee to read the citation. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon once again, and a very good day it is indeed. It's my distinct honor as chairman of the AGS Honors and Awards Committee to read the citation for the Column Geographical Medal. As you have just heard, this medal recognizes those who have distinguished themselves by geographical discoveries or in the advancement of geographical science. The Honor and Awards Committee finds just such worthy distinction in the career contributions of Dr. Lee Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is the geographer of the United States in his role as the director of the Office of the Geography and Global Issues of the U.S. Department of State. He assumed this position in 2005 to become the ninth director of this office since it was established in 1921. During the 90 plus years of its existence, the mission of the office has evolved from one of mapping mainly to one of addressing larger and continuing geographical challenges such as the oversight of many humanitarian efforts. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Lee Schwartz earned his bachelor's degree from Bucknell University in 1976 with honors in history and geography. His areas of specialization were political and population geography uh, and the USSR. Part of his inspiration came from his mentor at Bucknell, Professor Richard Pederek. He was led to pursue graduate studies here at Columbia University, where he earned his Master of Arts, Master of Philosophy, and doctoral degrees, the latter in 1986. After a seven-year stint at the American University, he joined the Department of State, and before assuming his current mantle, he served as an analyst for refugees and humanitarian emergencies. He served as the Division Chief for UN and Humanitarian uh, Affairs, and the Division Chief for Global Issues. He became the Deputy Director of the Office of the Geographer and Global Issues in uh, 2002 before rising to the directorship. Dr. Schwartz's office is the official repository of the U.S. position on all national borders and disputed borders. His Humanitarian Information Unit is the official source of information for, our, for all international relief efforts engaged by the U.S. government. 
Plus, he now leads the State Department in broader governmental efforts on water security, wildlife trafficking, human trafficking, and atrocities prevention. He also oversees diverse uh, efforts in war crimes and human rights accountability, food security, and environment and sustainable development. And they still produce more than 1,000 maps a year, three a day. In terms of advancing geographical science, he and his staff have revolutionized the U.S. government's use of new means of crowdsourcing and, in particular, imagery to the crowd. Plus, he co-chairs the Worldwide Human Geography Data Working Group. He has overseen the growth of personnel in the Office of the Geographer to its largest number since World War II. He initiated an international boundary verification process, oversaw the creation of the Humanitarian Information Unit, created and led the Tsunami Humanitarian Information Sharing Interagency Working Group, and has led State De Department of State efforts and other international efforts to numer too numerous to mention today. The importance of the Office of the Geographer of Global, uh, sorry, the importance of the Office of the Geographer and Global Issues and the recognition of the value of geographical science to our nation has been magnified through the talents and the initiative brought to the office by Lee Schwartz. Dr. Lee Schwartz uh, received the Department of State's prestigious Warren Christopher Medal in 2005, the Association of American Geographers Anderson Medal of Honor in 2011, and Bucknell University's Award of Merit in 2008. Through his sustained efforts to expand the applications of geographical sciences, address complex issues of national and international interest, he has advanced substantially those sciences. These achievements earned the unanimous endorsement of the AGS Honors and Awards Committee and the AGS Council for the award of the 2014 Cullum Geographical Medal to Dr. Lee Schwartz. And I now ask that Dr. Schwartz uh, join us on the stage for the presentation. Therefore, for these reasons and more, on behalf of its grateful members, worldwide scholars, and all those who recognize the importance of excellence in geographical research and exploration, the American Geographical Society honors Dr. Lee Schwartz by presenting him with a Cullum Geographical Medal presented to an individual who has distinguished himself in the advancement of geographical science on this 19th day of November in the year 2014 in New York City. Congratulations, Lee. Lee, would you like to say a few words? I know this comes as a surprise, but Jerry tells me that you're never at a loss for words. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, well, this was, this was a surprise and a, and a pretty sneaky way to try to get me on that uh, council um, as well. And I don't want to take up much of your time uh, because uh, I guess I'm responsible for getting us off track after I was very excited that we were back on schedule. But I just want to say that, that uh, I'm honored and humbled by this uh, by this award, I've always, uh, I've always had, um, I've, I've felt a little bit um, inferior compared to a lot of my uh, academic colleagues who, who contributed uh, a lot of, of research that I haven't really been able to do since I've been at the State Department. So it's nice being recognized for the, uh, for the work that I do do. Uh, all of which really is because of the, of, of the really talented people I've, I've been fortunate enough to have worked for me and because of the mentors I've had both in academia and government over the years. So uh, really I thank all of them because uh, it's, a, it's a body of work that I'm not responsible for, but I'm happy to take credit for. So thank you very much. This concludes our medal awards for 2014. Thank you.